Hi everyone, thanks so much for having me here today, it's a real honor. So I want to talk to you today about how artificial intelligence can help us advance science and in doing so, help improve health and well-being. And in 10 minutes, I'm hoping to cover quite a lot. We're going to talk about proteins, computational biology, artificial intelligence, art, and at some point I'm even going to touch on ships and seas. And in the interest of transparency, I also want to mention some of the things that I won't be covering today, some of my favorite things. So I won't be talking about the greatest football team in the world, Liverpool FC. I won't be talking about the greatest food, cookies. And I won't be talking about the greatest band, Radiohead. So if you're disappointed and want to leave now, I totally understand. Now, our story starts, as many of mine do, with me procrastinating. Because as I was preparing for this talk, I became engrossed in recent developments in AI image generation, which had prompted renewed debate about the nature and the meaning of art. Now, what is art is a fascinating question, and one that, thankfully, I'm not actually here today to answer. But from watching this debate unfold, I took away two things. Firstly, that art is in the eye of the beholder, and secondly, that context really matters. And so I wanted to start today by showing you an image of something that I've come to consider as art. This is protein by the artist most commonly known as nature, and I think this is a wonderful image for a couple of different reasons. Firstly, it depicts one of life's building blocks. Proteins underpin every biological process in every living thing, and they're found everywhere, from the skeletons and cells that we're made up of, to the plants that we eat, from the bacteria and viruses that cause disease to the antibodies that help us tackle those diseases. Proteins are basically essential to life as we know it. Secondly, this image starts to give you a sense of what intricate, exquisite biological machines proteins are and how the three-dimensional structure that you see here might determine the protein's function. For example, this protein is part of the nuclear pore complex, one of the largest molecular machines in cells, made up of around 1,000 protein subunits. And as you can perhaps get a better sense of here, this complex acts as a gatekeeper for everything that goes in and out of the nucleus in the cell, as well as organizing some essential cellular processes, such as transcription and ribosome assembly. And this range of roles means that the nuclear pore complex is thought to be increasingly involved in a growing number of diseases, including neurodegenerative ones, such as ALS and Parkinson's. And this idea that the structure of a protein determines its function actually makes a lot of sense when you think about it. Think about antibodies, which have a site that is designed like a lock to bind to a specific molecular structure, its key, as it were. Or take collagen proteins that are shaped like cords and transmit tension across cartilage, ligaments, tendons, and bones. And this applies even outside of biology. Think about something like a chair, right? The structure of a chair determines how you use it. If it's wide and big, you might sit back in it. If it's got a really good backrest and it's ergonomic, it's something that you can work from. If it's like tall, then it might be a bar stool. And so knowing how proteins are structured opens the door to better understanding their function, to better understanding how mutations and disease might affect that function, and to better discovering and maybe even designing drugs which interact with proteins. But determining this structure is a lot easier said than done. See, proteins are made up of a sequence of amino acids. You can think of this as its list of ingredients, as it were. And in nature, the sequence of residues folds spontaneously, often in milliseconds, into these intricate 3D structures that we see. Now, you can determine this structure experimentally, and indeed, that's pretty much the gold standard. But it can take a lot of time. As Bruno mentioned, sometimes people will spend an entire PhD trying to determine a single structure. And it can take a lot of expensive equipment, sometimes on the order of millions of dollars. And so you had this situation where, as of at least a year ago or so, um, of the roughly 200 million protein sequences that we knew of, we had experimentally determined the structure for around 200,000 of those. And so there's this huge opportunity there. Now, as the Nobel laureate Christian Anfinsen suggested in his acceptance speech around 50 years ago, we should be able to fully determine the tertiary structure of a protein from its primary structure, that sequence of amino acids. It's just really hard to do computationally. A scientist called Cyrus Leventhal in the 1960s showed that, on average, uh, an average protein might have 10 to the 300 possible conformations. And to put that into perspective, if you were to randomly enumerate through each of those conformations in order to try and find the right one, it would take you longer than the age of the universe. And so solving this protein folding problem, being able to accurately predict scale um, what 3D structure a particular sequence of amino acids might take on has been this 50-year-old grand challenge in biology. 
And it's the kind of grand challenge that we really relish at DeepMind, because it's one where AI can help us turn this abundance of information into understanding. It can help us deepen the nature of the questions that scientists can ask. And it can help us unlock and advance numerous avenues of research across health, pure science, sustainability, and more. So how did DeepMind use AI to provide a solution to this ch grand challenge? Well, I'm not going to go into too many details today. For those of you who are interested, we've open sourced our code. We've also published our methods in nature alongside 60 pages of supplementary information, which gives you some sense of just how complicated a system this is. But in short, protein folding is far too complex a phenomenon for us to be able to explicitly program a system with rules uh, to determine how a structure might be uh, formed. And so instead, what we require is a learning system, one that over time can optimize for finding and identifying this right structure and can expose patterns in this data that is intractable for humans. And by doing this, which, by the way, required multiple critical innovations in AI, required an in incredible interdisciplinary team, years of hard work, building on the efforts of many incredible scientists and institutions, and we developed this system called AlphaFold, and we entered that system into this wonderful community-led blind assessment for predicting protein structures called CASP. Through this assessment, we were able to independently confirm that AlphaFold could indeed predict the shape of a protein down to atomic accuracy at scale and in minutes. And as you can see here, the predictions in blue are very close to the ground truth in green. And this makes these predictions comparable to uh, experimental methods and therefore widely useful in practice. And so what did we do with these predictions? Well, as I mentioned earlier, we were aware that a breakthrough like the um, AlphaFold could have widespread and varied downstream implications for a number of avenues of research. And so to maximize the scientific impact and the eventual benefits to humanity of this, we decided to partner with the brilliant folks over at Emble EBI to develop this free and open resource available to all where anyone could input a protein sequence or search for a protein and get back its predicted structure, just like you would for an internet search. And over the last year, that database has expanded from a few hundred thousand structures to, as of today, 200 million structures. So that's almost every catalog protein known to science. And as you can see on the left, that database has already been accessed in the last 18 months by over 750,000 scientists, over 190 countries. And Alfold itself has been cited in thousands of papers. Now, when we released these structures, we wanted to be very mindful of the ethical implications. We wanted to apply our operating principles that try and ensure that we maximize the benefit of AI whilst also mitigating its risks and its negative potential outcomes. And so to do this, we consulted with over 30 experts from biosecurity, bioethics, human rights, and more to inform our release strategy. For example, we found that it's actually uh, clear that AlphaFold itself would not make it meaningfully easier to cause harm with proteins because there are many other practical barriers to doing so. And so providing free and widespread access was the best way of delivering benefit at this time. It also helped confirm our view that we needed to provide some kind of confidence metric with AlphaFold's outputs because it's not able to predict the, pr uh, the structure of a protein accurately in all cases. Indeed, many cases it doesn't. And so we wanted to make sure that scientists had this way of determining which parts of prediction uh, the model had high confidence in, which parts they should use, which parts might be able to complement some of their existing experimental data, and so on. And so how has AlphaFold been used so far? We've been really inspired to see some of the examples of what AlphaFold is being used for in the community. There's a group at the University of Oxford who are using AlphaFold to study the, a protein that is essential to the development of the malaria parasite in mosquitoes. And understanding the structure of this protein could help us develop a more effective vaccine. There's the Drugs for Neglected Diseases initiative that was mentioned earlier, who we partnered with to help speed up the discovery of new treatments into fatal parasitic illnesses, such as leishmaniasis. Then it's also helped, as I mentioned earlier, unveil more of this nuclear pore complex, which we hadn't actually experimentally determined a large, um, a large part of the proteins for. And in doing so, that might help uh, us understand far more diseases, given the essential and varied role that the nuclear pore complex plays in cells. And a group at the University of Colorado Boulder are using AlphaFold to help understand the structures of these enzymes that are actually involved in the mechanism that creates resistance to antibiotics. 
these are just a few examples of the ways in which AI is transforming the way scientists conduct research and accelerating progress across a wide range of applications. And I think it means that it ushers in a new era of hopefully digital biology or computational biology and also a new era of scientific discovery. And so to give you a little sense of how at least I think about that, I wanted to end with one more piece of art. And what I want you to do is I want you to picture this vast and immense sea which has many islands of knowledge scattered amongst it. And we explore this sea using science. And to date, we've been doing that exploration in the equivalent of rowboats. And that's not to undermine what we've discovered, quite the opposite. It's through human creativity, ingenuity, endeavor, and perseverance and curiosity that we've actually been able to discover so much that has dramatically improved health outcomes and well-being across the world. But if we move from rowboats to something like sailboats and we harness the technology of sails, we were able to travel so much further across real seas. And in fact, this image depicts the voyage of the Beagle, the ship that Charles Darwin went on as he first started to hypothesize and uh, develop his theory of evolution by natural selection. And in the same way, I hope that AI can transform how we explore these seas, how we discover new islands of knowledge, and they can assist us to go further, to go quicker with more people on board and advance human curiosity and creativity. And if we work collaboratively, if we make sure to be mindful of safety, responsibility, and equity, then what we discover using AI could not only involve, uh, advance science, but in doing so, it could also lead us to dramatically improve human health and well-being across the world for everyone. Thank you very much.